And now to talk more about air pressure, and specifically how it is related to a phenomenon we frequently deal with in wind. As we see, the wind can be a powerful shaper of parts of our landscape, as we see with this tree in the background from the United Kingdom. There's many examples of trees that kind of look like this along uh, the western coast of the United States and Oregon's coast as well. And so, because uh, to note that we're talking about pressure, we're talking about wind, you see how this tree is under pressure. Uh, by Queen and David Bowie, our song to get us in the mood talking more about air pressure and winds. So just review, uh, so note that when we have that greater air pressure at lower elevations because of gravity, as we go higher in elevation, again tied to land, or altitude uh, up in the air, um, we end up having that lower air pressure. And so the measurement that measures air pressure uh, is known as a barometer. And so I have an example on the right-hand side of uh, really the first invention of this in the 1600s AD uh, by an Italian physicist and mathematician. His name was Evangelista uh, Torricelli. He was able to essentially use this to fill up a tube with the element, chemical element mercury, and put it, as we can see here on this right-hand side, in this kind of tub, um, with, and really when submerged, you know, so it act as, as a vacuum. Um, and really, you know, this air uh, that was up here in the tube, um, you know, sealed. And so with this, you know, I'm just, I put, add these arrows here so in order to show that the air pressure pushing down on uh, that bowl of mercury. And so really that would, you know, with the greater air pressure, with more air molecules in the air, um, we would see then the, you know, the mercury in the tube rise. And then kind of conversely, you would see the air, or, um, you know, the air in the tube come closer down, um, you know, or the mercury itself fall, um, once we would have a lower air pressure again. So to note that, you know, he was able to then to show, okay, well, you could see even at a given location over time, uh, that air pressure, you know, some there seemed to be something, um, in this case, the air itself, um, that was pushing down on it and, you know, actually causing it to fluctuate over time, even for a single given location, not even, uh, let alone based on, again, depending on elevation, uh, in a kind of systematically greater uh, air pressure at lower elevations or lower air pressures uh, at higher elevations or altitudes. Um, so just to note that you know, we also come to see that our air pressure changes over time for any given location, and that also has important impacts as well um, for our, some of our Earth processes. So to note that, you know, okay, well, that's nice that we could you know, do have fancy instruments out there that don't only use, mer don't only use mercury today, they don't use a variety of other means to measure air pressure. Um, but if you don't want to go out and buy a fancy instrument, um, but you want to actually prove this to yourself, uh, this issue of air pressure, you can do so. Uh, with the example I give you here of the chip bag. So there's note that actually chip bags can uh, show us this as well in the sense that if we take, for example, the assumption that most chip bags um, are packaged at relatively low elevations, uh, so just to say uh, sea level, so uh, zero meters uh, above sea level, and we talked about you know how the sea level again was defined way back in the first module um, with the geoide, but I'm um, to note here that you know relatively low elevation these bag of chips are, are sealed, and because of that um, you know when they stay at that elevation um, you know see they're in Eugene um, for example and they're not very very high elevation you're pretty much packaged at that same relative elevation um, you know the, the 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 air pressure within the bag and then the air surrounding the bag have relatively pressure and so we see get something on the left where there is some you know and there's, there's not really any difference um, that probably might expect this to kind of normally look like you know and you can see that you could push it in a little bit um, and it would you know crinkle but um, you know it, you, there's definitely ability for give there because there's quite a bit of air pressure pushing on that outside of the bag but actually you know if you were to stick this uh, bag say in your car if you have a car um, or you know catch a ride with somebody or even you take a bus or something over let's say um well i'm a pass or up you know up over uh the cascade range you know you would see that as you gain altitude that actually that air that is trapped within the bag you know because it's in what we um in our sciences might actually term a closed system it is you know in this, its own kind of contained world um you know with the air that is inside there um, can't get out no air from the outside can get in because of that you know we can actually see that you know the, the pressure maintains within that same volume of the chip bag um but you know there's 
now relatively much more air pressure within the bag than the much lower air pressure again that's surrounding it um, in those, that much higher mountain uh, elevation air. And so you'd actually see that chip bag look something more like on the right. Now, actually, as you were to, were to rise and rise in elevation, that chip bag will appear to expand and expand and expand and look really poofy and actually it'll look like it's going to explode at any second. Um, because in that air pressure inside is exerting so much more than the outside, it's able to push out on that bag and inflate it to its full extent uh, or ability of size. Um, and so you know, that is another way that we can kind of prove to ourselves that actually, yes, we, we do have this phenomenon of air pressure um, and, and able to contain it within this kind of closed system example um, of our chip bag. And so this is important because, again, this ties to an air pressure and also ties to this concept of wind. And you may wonder, well, especially on windy days, why is it so windy? Um, and and you know, this is to note that it's all tied to differences in air pressure, which usually has something, uh, to some effect at least, uh, to do with temperature differences also caused at the Earth's surface. And so as we'll be looking at, there's two main components of wind, uh, its speed and its direction. And so we want to note with its speed and direction that these are determined by a number of forces that we're going to talk through in this lecture. Um, and also to note that, the, that winds are named for the direction from which they originate. So in the mid-latitudes where we reside, um, we end up having um, conditions that are most favorably, um, or you know, what we most often see, uh, what we term westerly winds, so winds that blow from uh, the west to the east. So we would term that an easterly wind if it went in the opposite direction, if it blew from east to west. Um, and, and so also tied to this, uh, we'll be looking at um, not only with those larger scale winds, um, or you know, in this case, winds from which the direction they normally originate, um, but uh, so there are the processes that are tied to kind of large scale, very broad across much Earth's surface scale patterns, um, and also conclude with a couple smaller scale uh, wind patterns as well. So again, to get into this idea, these forces that are tied to wind, um, the first one that is the most relevant, as we're going to talk to in terms of already air pressure, is simply termed the pressure gradient force. And so and there's a difference or a gradient between t uh, different pressure. Um, again, so we have a real area of relatively high pressure uh, and an area of relatively low pressure. We see by this GIF here that air is going to tend to move from um, that, in the absence of other forces, um, is going to move from high to low pressure. Again, so from where we have more dense air uh, to less dense air. And so um, you'll see this, in, if we're looking at this in a top-down sense, we will look, see something like this on future weather maps and other uh, maps who I'm using to look at barometric pressure or air pressure. Um, but to note that you know, we generally represent low uh, barometric pressure areas as designated by kind of this example on the top, usually a red L. Um, and so again, areas in the center of that are at its very lowest uh, pressure. And as you move out from that, you get higher pressures. Kind of in contrast, um, you have area of these blue H's in that we're in the center that is the very highest pressure and as you move out you then move out to lower pressures um, and so um, this, and that shows a top-down view here now we can also see this kind of a side view if we're standing at the ground looking forward you know we also have on the left hand side once again this left uh, excuse me, le uh, low pressure so where we have wind um, that's generated by the pressure gradient force we're coming from high to low so moving our air in, in this case towards that low pressure, and then when it piles kind of up on itself, and we'll see in the future as well that then that low pressure where we have relatively warmer air, or at least lower pressure air rising, um, and kind of in contrast, um, the air that is sinking down, um, at least that is relatively high pressure, um, that is sinking, or you know, that air is then descending to the Earth's surface and moving towards lower pressure. So, again, that is to note that if that, 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 you know, if our air would move in relatively straight lines from high pressure to low pressure if that was the only force that was acting on our air. Um, but to note and, and remember that our Earth is also a rotating um, spheroid or you know, an elliptical um, an oblate spheroid or particularly, um, you know, most specific we could term it air, of course, our geoid. And, and But to note that, you know, this roughly spherical object that we live on is... 
um, you know, uh, rotating about its axis. And to note that means then essentially actually its um, speed of rotation at the poles it becomes essentially zero because it is rotating on the, those polar axes. Um, but also then that means that actually at the equator, um, it is, the equator relatively is moving very, very fast. Um, and, and so you know, kind of the distance in between them, you get slower and slower speeds of the Earth actually kind of officially rotating as you move closer and closer to the poles away from the equator. And so in this, what we're, you know, the Coriolis force essentially then reflects that as this deflection of winds or any other objects that would be traveling across the Earth um, because of the Earth's rotating surface. So there's a series of um, links here that are able to explain this more in detail, so you can you know, visit all of these on the left hand here. But the main principle that we want to note um, is shown by the image on the right, and that objects that are able to, or objects are deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere, or objects are deflected to the left in the southern hemisphere. So you can also see this, um, you know, this image, there's also probably videos out there as well, um, and that is taken from the link that is below here. Um, here's just a short clip to show you, you know, the same kind of example occurs on a merry-go-round, again, another rotating sphere um, object, um, where you can see you know, that the, 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 excuse me, the ball um, appears to um, kind of curve uh, along these um, as it goes around the merry-go-round and the balls that are passed along here appear to curve um, because you know as it's thrown in a straight line you know, as the surface that it's moving on you know the merry-go-round itself moves and you know, it actually appears to then or, you know make that object shift to the right um, when really the object you know because because it was trajected along a um, initial intended path, as then we can see on this image here on uh, the next slide, you know, its initial intended path um, kind of in a straight line, its actual path then curves again to the right in the northern hemisphere or to the left in the southern hemisphere um, because as we as it moves away from that equator and the equator is moving faster and we get that deflection then in those directions. So the same kind of principle for the merry-go-round was we're going to have that intended path, but as that object then and rotates um, as you know, the ball moves. Um, it, you know, actually, its appeared path um, then, uh, kind of real path, as you see, kind of shifts in those um, deflected ways. And so, again, this is not only air that we can talk about. You know, pilots, for example, have to take kind of this when you're flying, um, say, especially long distances across the Earth, because again, um, the Earth is rotating below it. So many objects have to account for this deflection of the Coriolis force. And so when we combine those together, we end up having this more resulting pattern um, that has to take into account both of them and kind of more, now more of this curved resulting path as we can see on our image here. Um, these are um, these winds um, because they um, uh, are occurring without um, also then being in relation to a third force. Um, you know, and we actually term this geostrophic winds, excuse me, because they only occur in the upper atmosphere. Um, they don't occur with this third uh, component that because they're of friction, um, because there is you know, a lot of friction and such things for wind you know, to run into at their surface um, that can also cause it to change direction. And so once you finally take into account that third force, as we can see moving from the left-hand image to the right-hand side image here, so again that left-hand image just showing pressure gradient force and Coriolis force, so we have those geostrophic winds that kind of travel um, parallel to our um, lines or those those millibar lines um, again lines of equal barometric pressure or air pressure um, and with, again, they travel parallel to them compared to on the right hand side now when we add in friction that counters the Coriolis force and causes winds to cr now cross those isobars at an angle as we can see here so here would be a real wind once we take into account the pressure gradient force the Coriolis force and friction force um, all those different directionalities of that being that f produces our final wind direction and so this results then in the patterns that we see in this image um, where we end up having um, our uh, high and low pressure as we see above the equator the, you know, on the top ones being our northern hemisphere or high pressure or what we term anti-cyclones are, are um, we see end up being uh, encircling out of those higher pressure areas in a clockwise manner um, and, and conversely we have our low pressure where we end up having 
uh, the air spinning in in a counterclockwise direction, as we can see here. And again, that is reversed then within our uh, southern hemisphere, where now we have low pressure with air that cycles into these uh, places, um, in the lower pressure areas, uh, in a clockwise manner, and high pressure um, air goes out of those anticyclones in an uh, again anti-clockwise or counterclockwise matter. And so you say, well, why is that important? Or more specifically, why is that important in terms of, like how, or how do I keep even those directions straight? Um, so we're going to just focus here on the northern hemisphere, but one example that I like to use um, in keeping these chains, uh, these different um, so hopefully you're familiar, actually, maybe you used to be retro, you used to have one of these cool watches that used to have twos and fives that look something like now, now what I have displayed here. And so we can see on the left-hand side that we have twos, and there's a two, example two, as you might see on a digital um, clock. And noting that actually with this example, how the ends of it kind of go around in this counterclockwise way, um, and, and conversely, the fives, the ends of it, actually, if we kind of cycle them around in a circle, end up going in this clockwise way. And so we can note that, well, two is lower than five, and so you know, twos actually help us remember that um, in the northern hemisphere, again, we end up actually seeing this counterclockwise direction, where fives um, in the air that is cycling out of them, of those high pressure cells, um, because five is higher than two, uh, high pressure cells end up um, you know, having air moving out of them in that clockwise direction, once again, in the northern hemisphere. So that's just one simple way you can help to try and remember yourselves that two uh, and the five and those kind of old digital clocks, um, and, you know, digital watches, for example, can help you remember um, what is what direction low pressure and high pressure um, the, the air moves into or out of them. So note this, we see this at very large scales. So for example, we'll be looking more at big storms and, and coming uh, lectures and, and talking about more about weather. But in examples of um, cyclones, both in the northern hemisphere, as we see in the top image, um, and the uh, also in the southern hemisphere, and how we can see, uh, once again, we have that low uh, pressure area that is spiraling inwards, um, and you know that you can see kind of by that rotation, this counterclockwise rotation inwards, um, and in the northern hemisphere, and actually kind of inverse, and we have that, no, we have, again, you can see the spiral in here. Um, in a clockwise manner uh, in the southern hemisphere, so how that is reversed. But again, note that this is scale dependent. Um, as you kind of may have heard this urban legend before, that actually you know the, these Coriolis force are kind of you know, tied to the spinning with all these forces together. It ends up leading to um, you know, that the toilet water, for example, if you flush it, um, always cycles down. In, in, in our case, for the northern hemisphere, in a counterclockwise way. Um, but that's actually not uh, always true. It's it's not. Um, unfortunately, you know, there's not a consistent pattern to that um, because it's such a small scale um, compared to the very large you know, hundreds of kilometers that we're seeing here, a scale of these big storms uh, and objects across the Earth's surface. And so, once again, we can look at this um, kind of another series of GIFs that goes through a year of the mean sea level pressure and surface winds. Um, again, there's also a, a measure air pressure at higher ele uh, elevations or altitudes as well. Um, and, and so, but you know, we're now again just focusing on sea level pressure. Um, we can see this change. Again, here's a January example and here's July. Um, and to look at how some of these areas, you know, we end up getting much higher, uh, for example, pressure in the northern hemisphere over these oceans, the North Atlantic, North Pacific in the summer, and then, then as compared to a much stronger lower pressure systems that we get in those same area type of areas in January or, or winter months. And I'll talk about again, why that's important for weather in upcoming uh, lectures. So finally then, to, so we looked at in those past slides some, a few of the large scale um, changes or you know, large scale processes that are determining wind wind patterns. I'm going to now just focus, focus and finish off with a couple of small scale wind patterns. Um, so examples that you might also be familiar with if you are from Oregon or uh, living along the coast or coastal California, for example, um, where we have this one example of the land sea breeze. Um, so essentially where, again, because we have that faster heating of land surface during the day, um, you have noticed that um, during many days, then this causes that the air over that land to uh, heat up, you know, thermally expands and rises, so we have relatively low pressure at that air, or at uh, the surface. So we can see in this top example here where that air rises, and it's lower pressure, it brings then air coming in from uh, the ocean 
and, and we have this you know, onward sea breeze during the day. I'm kind of cycling around here in this pattern, and where we end that obviously kind of get an opposite pattern or directly opposite pattern within this opposite pattern at night because we end up having now a sinking of that air uh, over the land surface because we have that thermal contraction again that land cools off a lot faster than the ocean surface um, and so we end up then pushing that um, you know, condensed sinking air to that higher pressure air now over the land back out over the ocean at night so you have this land breeze that goes off uh, from the land at night so the wind pattern versus what we're to see at night um, and then starts all over again the next day relatively usually you know, with the lower pressure um, air again on the land once the sun gets up in the sky and starts to heat that land again see a similar type of thing um, again another Oregon possible example here with valley and mountain breezes the same kind of sun concept where warmed air moves upslope during the day um, but then when we have night conditions that cooling air contracts and essentially sinks back down into valleys and cools off there at night so you can show look at this example uh, this link example here that I have provided um, to look at some visual examples of that. So that concludes talking about wind and our patterns there. And we'll be moving to some other uh, atmospheric and oceanic um, circulation patterns uh, in the next lecture.